questioning is perhaps the greatest gift we have as human beings. Science is more than a body of knowledge. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of thinking that teaches us to question everything we think we know. Science came about by developing techniques, methodologies for gaining reliable knowledge about the world. We have at our fingertips the technologies that were only possible for the largest governments and corporations 20 years ago as an individual today. If the human civilization continued at anything remotely like the current pace of technology advancement for a million years, where would we be? I think we're either extinct or on a lot of planets. The good thing about science is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. We hold the scientific method in high regard because it works. If it stopped working, we'd throw it out. Discover the past. Create the future. This, this, this is the Here and How podcast. Welcome to the Here and How podcast, where every week we dive deep into big ideas to explore the past and create a brighter future. This is episode seven, Is Homosexuality Natural? I'm Stephen Woodford, also known as Rationality Rules, and with me is the talented Thomas Westbrook, also known as Holy Cool Lead, and the rascal Rachel Oates. Say hi, guys. Hi, Hello. Guys. <laughs> I've been uh, using uh, descriptive words, beginning with T and R, to basically introduce you and i realized oh. just three episodes of doing it that it's a mistake because there's almost none for t and there is really like none for r they have become derogatory and i can't do that to you rachel <laughs> like Ra- <laughs> rascal rascal's the getting there. one yet to be honest to be fair <laughs> i i agree with that you are a rascal uh, i think our viewers know it i think your viewers know it uh yeah you're definitely a rascal i but, can uh, think of terrible and terrific yeah, well, those did come up, and I thought, they just don't work. Um, there's, there's Tolerable, uh, too. Oh, that's a brilliant one. Yeah, toler- the Tolerable Thomas Westbrook. <laughs> oh, and the random Rachel Oates. But yeah, I will uh, start using um, the same terms I've used before, because because of that. Because you're oh, so, unoriginal. Exactly. Your lack exactly. of creativity. I know, man, I'm spent. <laughs> um. Okay, so we've already dived off, and that's fantastic, because that's what we do. Yes. So, so I'm going to start with an easy one, okay? Mm-hmm. What is homosexuality? It's where a person likes another person who has the same genital system. That's, that's, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> yep. It's an Are abomination you... that God <laughs> disapproves of. <laughs> I was waiting for that. I was like, come on, come on, Thomas, I'm waiting. <laughs> to be fair, you... It, that's a good answer, but you're jumping the gun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I like that you put on a thick American accent for it. I think that's telling. Well, most Southern so, Baptist uh, preachers have, you know, thick Southern accents, so it's like they do. They, I can't understand them. Um, God will punish <laughs> you. <laughs> is that taught from childhood? Is that a thing, or is it? It's just it's cool to accentuate the words. Well, that I th- I think that's just a pastor thing to accentuate it like that, but the the strong mm. southern drawl they just pick up on from being around other people with strong accents. Yeah, no, fair enough. That makes sense. Like if uh, if you start traveling at a young age, like you lose it, you lose your accent. Yeah, that's kind of what's happened to your accent, right? Uh, yes and no. So like if I if I'm down south for too long and then I leave mm-hmm. the country for the first like couple months or so, people are like, "Oh, you you sound like you're from Texas," and then it kind of goes away. Yeah, I mean, for, so. for me listening to you, you don't you don't have a typical American accent. It is American for sure, but it just doesn't seem so typical. I don't know if you agree with mm. me there, Rachel. Yeah, no, it, it definitely doesn't sound southern. I wouldn't have put you as being like southern American. No, you um. sound smarter than that. <laughs> 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 I, I of course jest. I know there's very smart southerners. Mm. Um, I, I I actually I had a, an algebra teacher in college who um, one of the German students is like I just I know that he's really smart but I can't take him seriously because he has a strong southern <laughs> accent. Yeah, and it's I it's amazing a, uh, how much we should do a whole episode on how we associate accents with intelligence because oh it, when, it very when, much happens yeah when Americans hear a British accent a lot of times they think like oh they're so smart. And yeah, I, I, I get that a lot, actually. And Yeah, and you're right, it's not the case. But I get that a lot because of the British accent. Mm-hmm. Um, and as soon as somebody says you've got a British accent, it makes you sound uh, smarter. I all, all of a sudden start acting like I come from Oxford <laughs> rather than the Isle of Wight and Portsmouth. But, uh, <laughs> that's true for that's a lot of British accents, but not the Northern accent. Like, especially mm. Yorkshire. Mm. Yeah, oh, Yorkshire's horrible. But I, I had the same oh. case as what Thomas was just saying. In the sense, oh, I should I should add, in my opinion, I don't like <laughs> the accent. But um, I had a lecturer, very very smart man. Mm. Um, but I, one, I couldn't understand what he was saying, and two, I just I couldn't get over the fact that he had that accent. Yeah. Uh, life's full of hard perils. 
<laughs> Speaking I, of I things that are it. hard, I, I like how we completely derailed the topic from homosexuality to accents. And like we we do, flat. we do. And, and, yeah. and you're absolutely right. Well, accents that, will come at another yeah. time. So we're, that, we're gonna... That's the thing, though. We don't discriminate against people based on their sexuality. Only mm. against people their with accents. weird accents. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you can't help it. It's natural, as it were. And we but, lost um, our one viewer that has a silly accent. <laughs> Oh man, we lose all our one viewers. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they they, they, add, up. Us they point, add, add up. They somehow add up. They do. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> brilliant. I would just wonder about the audience. They go, God, they are, they're always assuming our uh, our accents. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff. So, um, Rachel, you hit on the na- the nail on the head. It's basically same genitalia. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, I've, got, I've got a definition here that I read. Um, it's simply romantic attraction, sexual attraction, or sexual behaviour between members of the same sex or gender. So exactly what you said. It's not controversial. We all know this. It's, it's not. That's not a thing. But it's worth putting it in the forefront of our minds before we proceed forward. So the second question I have for you, and it's also an easy one, is what does it mean to say that something is natural? Oh. See, I don't think that's an easy question. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. For me, I'd say it's natural if it's just kind of... <sighs> oh. Hard, harder question than uh, than it seems, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I would I, say... I, I would say something that occurs on its own in nature. Mm, but technically, life... Thinking... We did our abiogenesis episode. Life occurs yeah. on its own naturally and gets us to this point, and then we naturally create things that aren't considered natural, like laptops mm. and yeah. microphones. Exactly. And then do you consider laptops and microphones um, natural? Because they are a product of nature. If we're a product mm. of nature, which the evidence strongly indicates, then what we do is a product of nature. So it's one of these people have in their mind, it doesn't occur in nature. And you're right. You're both right. Actually, mm. if you, you're using that definition, it's a pointless definition because we, as far as the evidence shows, everything that is related to biological uh, organisms is an expression of nature it is derived from nature technically so, isn't isn't something natural if it's not supernatural yeah so, that's another yeah, that's another one we could run with i mean the only problem is that we have no evidence whatsoever of anything being supernatural and, yeah, so, and, and if we did yeah. wouldn't it become natural it would exactly so it's it's like natural is one of those words that falls in it's very easily used people understand what you're saying but if you really start diving into well, what does it actually mean people aren't really too sure it just it just fits there's a multitude of definitions mm-hmm. the but the best that i've come up with and you can tell me if you think i'm wrong on this is basically it you can consider something to be natural if it's derived from nature as opposed to humankind that's a clumsy definition, but it seems to be the one that, that works the best. Um, so I... humankind produce laptops. We don't look at that as natural. It doesn't occur in nature. Mm-hmm. Whereas, um, yeah, you, you look at a tree. Well, that occurs in nature. Mm-hmm. It occurs without any kind of uh, intervening from humankind. Well, what about like skin products that say like purely natural or something? It's like, I guess mm. the, the ingredients are natural, but the process certainly isn't. Yeah, exactly. So you'd say, and of course, th- then the products and the advertisers are playing with the word itself and taking advantage of the fact that it's not well defined. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's technically, this is sea salt from the Mediterranean or, or whatnot. And that might be true. Um, then you're getting into the avenue of, well, how much is it? Do they have to have in the product in order to say that? It might be, it must be at least 1%. And then they sell it like it's more. But the point being is that there are things that occur in nature and there are things that occur exclusively because of humankind. Mm -hmm. And we can draw a distinction between them and for the sake of brevity, say that one is natural and the other is a product of humankind. But it's, it's, it's definitely you guys are right on the money with immediately saying, actually, that's not an easy question. It's hard. Mm. So the next question I have for you is, is homosexuality natural? Does it occur in nature? Yeah. 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 Okay. Excellent. So <laughs> what examples do you have just so that we can proceed from there? Um, well, I want to say cheetahs have like a very strong homosexual tendency. Sure. Where that you'll see sense. two two um, cheetahs of the mm-hmm. the same sex that are behaving in uh, homosexual behavior. 
Yep. And that's, that's just one. one of, I, I think there's like dozens. If you go on like Wikipedia, you can find lists of like dozens and dozens of animals that are, um, yeah, that exhibit homosexual yeah. behavior at times. There is, there's, there's tens of thousands. It is really popular. Is, so when uh, I was maybe. younger, I, I yeah, yeah, tons, absolutely tons. It, it seems to be more in mammals, particularly it's more popular mm -hmm. than it's not. Um, now I bought into hearing a preacher when I was younger saying that it's not natural because, well, how, how can it be natural? Because it is against evolution as well. You know, it's, it's not like homosexuals can reproduce. How can that be considered natural? And that, even as someone that was non-religious, I, I, I stopped and considered that. And I have very good friends that have bought into that before until I've alleviated them from that delusion, as it were. But it's an easy, it's easy to see why people come to that conclusion. Um, so with us saying that homosexuality is natural, um, that's the question answered. So, good <laughs> well, episode, I, guys. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, Rachel will be, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I think if if I were to play the devil's advocate and come at this from you know a creationist pastor's point of view, yes, I think that that is the crappiest argument that they can possibly use. Because since when does mm. natural mean moral? Like yeah. even if you know, one we see yeah. homosexuality yeah, yeah, yeah. in nature, but we also see rape in nature. We see yeah. murder in nature. We yeah. see all kinds of horrible, horrific things yeah. in nature. We see There's, cannibalism yeah. in nature. In, yeah. in monkeys, mothers often um, touch their son's boy parts as a way of calming them down. Yeah. I mean, yeah. as soon as somebody starts appealing to nature for morality, yeah. well, it's, it's known as the appeal to nature fallacy for a reason. Mm -hmm. You just you 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 just got to apply some reductio ad absurdum, and you just show them. Oh well, if you're saying what's natural is what's right, then mm -hmm. as you just said, rape is natural. It happens in every culture. Animals rape each other all the damn time. You yeah. can't just select one and say that's okay because it's natural, and that's not okay because it's not. And of course, this comes into GMOs with food, etc., where people go, "Oh, I don't want to eat genetically modified food. It's not natural." While eating broccoli, which is <laughs> well, completely made from us, basically. Yeah. <laughs> there are lots of things that aren't natural that are perfectly fine that we do all mm -hmm. the time. Like right now, we're talking over Skype. That's not yes. natural. Yeah, yeah. But I, I know very few Christians who would argue that, you know, unless they're like Amish or something, that there's anything wrong with using technology that's not natural. And even the Amish, they're, they're fine with technology as long as they don't as as long as they don't see it as a window into certain other temptations. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and also going back to the argument that like it's it's not like normal or natural because you can't have children that way. There are so many things we get pleasure out of that don't end in pregnancy. <laughs> Mm. Like, would you oh, yeah, say lots, reading yeah. a book is wrong because you don't get pregnant from it? No. Ah, like, so yeah, no. That's or a, what a, what uh, about that birth is control? a good point. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. Absolutely. They do apply, but there is something to be said about somebody that is completely homosexual. Um, they are not going to reproduce. So intuitively, and not really thinking well, too much about it, that's... I think it's very easy to see that and go. How can that be natural? You, evolution can't select for that because they're not reproducing. Um, that's, that's not true, though. There's many ways that, like, homosexual people can have children. Like, they could, so, they could get yeah. a surrogate. They can get, like, um, in vitro fertilization. They, there's all sorts mm -hmm. of ways. There is. And we will yeah. tap into those in just a well, second, actually. Well, now, that's, now that's there a good are, place but to head. I think but the question is, how, can, how could that yeah. arise through nature? Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. I mean, uh, would you guys agree with me when I say that I can I can understand why that argument seems persuasive when presented that way? Um, I don't buy it. I know how to deal with it, and we're going to do so in this mm. in this in this video. But to me, that's a strong argument um, without understanding mm. the context of things, without having a firm grasp on evolution. I can see why that convinces e uh, non-religious people. Actually, I think maybe if, as a species, your only goal is to reproduce and create more species, but if you look at where humanity is right now, mm. everyone reproducing isn't good for us. We're already overpopulated. So our only goal isn't to create more children. We have more no, goals no, than no. that in life. So yeah, yeah, I still don't find it convincing. <laughs> okay, so would you say that if, for example, mm -hmm. every um, um, species, sorry, every member of a species was homosexual, was not interested in the mm -hmm. opposite sex at all, and we wasn't in a state such as humanity where we can have um pregnancy induced via mm -hmm. other means 
would you not say that that at least looks like it's not pertaining to evolution by natural selection considering the yeah. evolution by natural I'd, selection I'd the driving force yeah. yeah so from that like the the things that you raised mm. are absolutely legit and would definitely tap into those but i just wanted to basically mm. still man the argument as it yeah. were because I, I i do see why that feels like a strong argument and i've mm. had a very very smart friend of mine buy into that before and it mm. took the conversation that's about to happen now to convince yeah. him otherwise like and it's not because he's stupid or anything mm. it does seem pretty pretty yeah. natural in that sense I, I can understand it but i just have a problem like seeing these isolated ar arguments and not putting them into context yeah, yeah and that, that's that's great that, that that's why you often yeah. get to the right answer because you think oh there's more to this let's yeah. put it in context and that's a good thing that's a, that's the nature of a critical mind and that's good I, yeah, that see, I, can, good. I can see how it might be a like if, if you don't stop and you don't think it through and if you don't understand the mechanisms of um evolution at the gene level and like uh like dawkins really goes into this particular issue in the selfish gene but if I can see how it might be a difficult argument to overcome as far as, you know, where did homosexuality come from? Mm. It's not really yeah. an argument for the morality of it, though. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. a great point. And um, these are all things I want to touch on in just a second. But you're absolutely right. Conflating uh, whether or not it's natural with morality mm -hmm. is, is the appeal to nature fallacy. And it needs to be shot down any time it's seen. And the way you can do it, although it shuts people off, is, is just say rape is natural. Normally they go, oh, don't bring that in. That offends me. It's a nasty word. Well, what you're saying is disgusting. So I'm going to use terms like this to or, or cannibalism bring this to your attention. Yeah, you cannibalism. Have spiders and praying mantises that will eat their own. Like they'll mate yep. with them and then they'll eat their partner. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So before we delve into all of this, I have a I have I have a Rachel style or Rachel inspired <laughs> quiz for you both. Okay. <laughs> I hope I hope I do you justice, Rachel. <laughs> I'm sure Off you the are. I'm I, I wow, well, you're gonna have to pretend I do. So <laughs> <laughs> of the following six species, which one doesn't practice homosexuality? Ooh. Penguins, cockroaches, llamas, American house spiders, salmon, or whiptail lizards. Do you want me to give you those again? I'm surprised you have two um, spiders in there because I didn't realise that spiders mm. are huh. Did I say two spiders in there? Well, yeah, I, you had I two you had one. I thought, oh, I thought it was one. Even, well, I would definitely say it again. Yeah. Didn't you say tarantulas, or did I just completely have a brain fart there? You made that up, sir. You absolutely <laughs> made To be fair, people were going to be able to go, right, I'm going to go back 30 seconds. And despite me now acting as if I didn't say it, they're going to be going, I'm writing a comment. He did say it. No, I, I, I'm fairly certain I didn't. But um, wow. off, did off the I follow... What? Well, yeah. Say it, go, run through them again. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Of the following six species, which one doesn't practice homosexuality? Penguins, cockroaches, llamas, American house spiders, salmon, or whiptail lizards? I think penguins do, don't they? Okay, all right. So you, so you reckon penguins do? Yeah? I feel like I've read something about that. I, yeah. I think llamas do. I can, can see read, llamas like... doing that. Yep, okay. Yeah. What, why, so why can you both see <laughs> penguins and llamas having... Uh, homosexual intercourse well, llamas are just full of love and they're a little bit sassy so <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think how so like with, with a spider it mm. don't they uh, I, I think the, it might depend way, on the, the, the specific spiders but don't they mm -hmm. like lay egg sacs and then or the, mm. do they mate first and then lay the egg sacs yeah, they mate first, and then they can lay the. Okay, they don't out. fertilize the eggs outside. The, um, I, I should say I don't know for all cases, but I do know that uh, certainly a lot of spiders reproduce that way. I'm I'm revealing my ignorance on insect <laughs> biology. I guess they're not oh. insects; they're arachnids or. God, I'm yeah, a, yeah, they're, yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they're this not, is one area yeah, yeah, yeah. of my, my knowledge. That is I, I should say this so someone lacking. else doesn't have to. In, um, spiders are not insects; they are arachnids. I, I, yeah, <laughs> and I, I called. I stopped myself, but you did. You did. You 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 were well in there. Yeah, uh, cockroaches. Yeah. I think that that is an insect, though. That that falls in yeah. there. Yeah. Have, so we got yeah. pe penguins, cockroaches, llamas, American house spiders, salmon, and whiptail lizards. Which one of those doesn't practice homosexuality? I think I'm going to go with the, the salmon. I okay. was going to say salmon too, because I was going to say llamas, I think, probably do, because again, they're mammals, so they're a little bit more likely to, because a lot of mammals do. Cockroaches, 
I don't they like breed quite a lot so I think they would be likely to just kind of go for any sexual act you see Salmon... once, once a cockroach is pregnant it, mm-hmm. it just produces babies for the rest of its life oh um, does it yeah, it's, oh, it's very, if, I, if, if okay. my memory serves me correctly. But they do actually have to get pregnant once. Yeah. I don't know. See, salmon, I kind of think, don't they do okay. the thing where they kind of spurt out the eggs and then get another guy to come along and mm-hmm. fertilise them? So yeah. I, I kind of think, like, maybe, I'm agreeing, maybe they don't, because I'm not sure yeah. if they even have actual, like, intercourse. No, fair enough. Okay, so you're yeah. both going for salmon. Mm. Uh, the the answer, you're not going to like me for this, oh, is is none of them. It's a trick question. They are all oh. homosexuals. You monster! Well, they all... I know, I know, I know. I know. Uh, they, like tens of thousands of species, practice homosexuality. I know that was very mean of me. Huh. But monster. I do have some caveats to add, which ties into what you guys were saying. So, while mammals, birds, and pretty much any social species practices homosexuality purposely, um, there's a lot of evidence that indicates that most insects, arachnids, and fish do it only by an accident. And the reason for this is when there's certain pheromones present, the males almost always go for the females. Mm. So that's an interesting one. So when we were going back to the definition of um, homosexuality, that the definition that we used encompasses people doing it accidentally, or I should say animals doing it accidentally. And so they are conducting homosexual practice there. Whereas so, when it comes to social species, it is deliberate. So um, when you say accidentally, are you saying that like if – Maybe that there's a a male that gets covered in female pheromones and then yep, he that's, gets yep. approached by another male. Is, yeah, that isn't happens. that just like yeah. people going up to someone they see in a club and being like they're attractive, but not knowing what genitals they have. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, you got to be drunk for that. I'll be honest. Well, but... No, you, you know what so this reminds me of. <laughs> this this reminds me of like the ants that. Like if if one of them is diseased or like dead or something, then the other ants will take it out of the the nest and throw yeah. it outside. But if one of the ants that's like doing that somehow gets covered in or gets you know uh, sprayed with or something the the pheromones of this yeah. dead ant, then like the the other ants can't tell the difference and they'll take the live ant and drag it out and toss it out and they'll keep tossing it out until the the pheromones wear off. Yeah, that, that makes. I didn't know that. That's fantastic. But I do know that insects are very heavy, heavily in, uh, dependent, especially social insects, on pheromones. Pheromones that play a massive role. Mm-hmm. And with the spiders, particularly, um, although of course they're arachnids, they have a similar thing. And as soon, as soon as the males figure out, and it's normally through pheromones, from what the studies are showing, um, that it's a male, they're not interested. They want females, but. When it comes to birds and uh, mammals, particularly anything that's a social species, that seems to be the clue. A social species, um, it, it's practice, and and it's and it's like a ten percent of the population, and it seems so strange, but it is just the case. I mean, if you have a pet dog, you may have seen uh, yeah. <laughs> that this is entirely possible. They, they go <laughs> for anything that's there. Yeah, including exactly. the couch <laughs> and the stuff. But Steve, it sounds you're like me. what you're telling me yeah. is that um, if I was an insect, then those uh, pheromone infused body wash products would actually work. <laughs> yes, they would. They would. It would be. It would be great. That's that's how you would get laid as an insect. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, you, you. I'd say I, I will say that you passed my quiz because the quiz wasn't passable. Uh, <laughs> Now, before we get into the science, I've got another question for you, and that is, why is this question even relevant today? Like, why is it a thing? I mean, you touched on the answer earlier. It seems to be because religion, people are right? Douches. Yeah. Well, it's essentially it's it, it is it's religion, and more specifically, it's actually Abrahamic religion. So there is there is some sects in other religions for sure that are against homosexuality, but if you want serious opposition to it, it is in the form of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And there's good reason for that. The books are very explicit with how to treat people, you know, they express disdain and disgust for homosexuality and the some of the that punishments comes to are mind severe. Is if if a man lies with another man as one lies with a woman, they should be or it's an abomination and they should be stoned to death or put to death. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. and if if you're somebody that really takes the Bible seriously and you read that verse, in, I think it's in Levi- Leviticus, um, I might not be, but if you read that and it is proposed as, and it is given as an edict, 
then you're going to take it seriously. And that's that's largely why there's such a big taboo and issue around the topic or has been because, you know, we've, we're we pretty much solving that. Um, I, I don't remember when America legalized um, uh, a homosexual marriage, but it wasn't too long ago, if I remember correctly. I think it was 2016, if mm. I'm not mistaken. And oh, actually, I, I had... I. I was no, in a my, a my loft. Sis, wait, no, my sister got married in states. New York in 2016, so it might have been 2015. Mm. Well, there were different states that had it legal before it was federally legal. Oh, yeah, okay. and then they made it like over. It's just like, yeah. sorry, Texas, and, you're, you're having it. <laughs> well, I, I was in. I was living in Texas at the time, and I was in a loft um, downtown that had like it was. It was one of those like lofts that has like, it's a along the building is a long strip that has. Uh, coffee shops and bars and restaurants down below on the first floor and there was a gay bar at the end on on the corner and literally i want to say it was like the day or the weekend after it became legalized the bar just caught on fire and burned down for some odd reason oh and i thought this was yeah. gonna be a happy story <laughs> well and and i was i was living in the built like i was asleep and i wake up and i smell like smoke and gas and all this stuff mm. and i like i run to the window and i look outside and there's like fire trucks and i was like holy crap like nobody nobody even like knocked on my door and stuff like i like had to you know leave and yeah. go find a hotel or something for the you know God. That but, that is crazy, but yeah, you horrible. get backlashes. Uh, I know that when they I'm like I'm I'm it. not even gay, and and homophobes almost <laughs> killed me. <laughs> <laughs> that would be written on your uh, tombstone. <laughs> 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 oh man, but um, yeah, it, it is interesting to know how relevant that question is to particularly the Abrahamic religions, because uh, as you probably both know, um, Spartan men, you know, like the film Three Hundred, etc. They were and still are heralded as some of the toughest, strongest, and most courageous men of pretty much of all time. And they frequently practiced homosexuality and actually promoted it because they believed it was not only natural, but that it was a fantastic form of bonding. Um, Mm. It wasn't taboo. It was actually a thing. It was promoted. The same is true of the ancient Romans and indeed pretty much any society and culture before them, such as the Mesopotamians, the indigenous peoples of uh, the Americas. And likely, but not conclusively, the ancient Egyptians. There's there's mixed evidence on that one, and there's actually not a lot of, lot of evidence in e- either way's favour, <laughs> just because of the records, etc. But it's it seems to have just been accepted until the last two thousand years, with the prevalence of that pressure from from mainly Abrahamic religions, but religion in general. And when you couple that with what what was said before, where you can make a compelling argument. Um, without context of saying that how can homosexuality be natural when it literally ceases reproduction you can see why it's it's had a grip on society like it has i don't know if you both agree but i i can see what's going on there yeah i i actually like i only found this out recently but i i had been told when i first started my youtube channel that a lot of people who wrote that homosexuality was wrong in the bible said that they wrote it because um, it was like meant to kind of save lives because you know gay sex can be dangerous and that sort of thing. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. apparently it was actually only written because the writers of like Leviticus were trying to condemn this like other like group of people or other society or other tribe or whatever, and they practice homosexuality, and so as mm. a result they were trying to condemn everything they did, which included homosexuality, and that's why they were like God hates homosexuality. So these guys are wrong and don't do anything right, they do. Yeah. Apparently, that was the reason they wrote it in Leviticus, um, and so that's interesting. I know, I know it's in the Torah um, mm. as well, which is dated uh, further back, of course. Yeah. That was uh, well, that's, there was that's a lot really of there was a lot of cultural warfare going on at the time related mm. to you know religious identity. So, like you have, um, if if you read the Old Testament initially, it is a very um, poly, like a uh, polytheistic. Um, religion, you know, the like, why does it say you shall have no other gods before me? Why does it say don't craft images of other gods? Why does it say that God is a jealous <laughs> yeah. God? Why does it start off, you know, Genesis starts off, you know, we shall let us make man in our image. And like, there's no mention of Jesus. There's no mention of the Holy Spirit throughout the entire Old Testament at all. Mm. And, 
you know, even the the so-called prophecies about him, you you go in and you read the context and it's like, it's not talking about Jesus. It's talking about like something completely different. And, yeah. and it's like you, you have kind of a, this polytheistic uh, religion that then all of a sudden it goes from, you know, I'm the king of the gods, which all of the other religions around at the time would have, you know, the head God, you know, like Zeus mm-hmm. or, um, uh, what's his name? Um, God, uh, why am I, I blanking figured. on the, the Roman? Um, Jupiter. Jupiter. Jupiter yeah. yeah. Brain fart. Sorry. Um, you know, and, and, and so you had this, this happening in, you know, all throughout the region where, you know, you'd have, first you'd have kind of a polytheism and then you'd have like some God at the top and then it would kind of shift into monotheism. And it happened with um, the Egyptians as well with, yeah. with Ra. And so for, well, for the, What's quite interesting the, about the Egyptians is that they had this kind of like polytheistic system and then it was Tutankhamun's father who like came along and tried to be like, no, there's only one god and he like mm. tried to get everyone to follow this one god and then when he died, Tutankhamun came along and were like, yeah, we're just going to revert that for a while. Yeah, like, they yeah. hated him for it. Of them. Yeah. But Sorry, the, just throwing that out there. <laughs> nah, that's interesting. Really interesting. Yeah, the, the Israelites though, one of the ways that they were able to kind of um, solidify their identity and to, to you know, say like, have some point of like unity for them to form around was like you know this is our god and it's better than all the other ones and we're gonna crush them in warfare and like it almost kind of looks like sports mascots you know how you have like you know (laughs) we're gonna crush the the broncos and we're the you know whatever the ravens or the cowboys or whatever and it's it's like you know our team and our symbol and our mascot and all this is better than yours and like they're forming around this particular identity yeah. And then when they would crush them, then their gods would get destroyed, their idols would get destroyed, and, you know, th- they would, you know, prop up their own in its place as kind of something yeah. to, to unify, you know, around. So it's it's interesting how you have, you're talking about homosexuality in that light, where it's like, you know, trying to, to kind of cri- demonize the other, the outsider yeah. in this. Yeah. I just, I find it so bizarre, though, that so many people today are trying to, like, spread this honestly really hateful, like, ideology of, like, homosexuality is wrong just because a few people wrote some books and wrote some lines to try and, like, condemn a little group of people. Like, it it seems like such a silly little thing to base, like, your whole life upon now. And the fact that you're trying to, like, stop people having a normal life, a normal relationship, a family, just because of something a couple of people wrote to get back at like a little tribe or something it's insane to me and it's like people forget the human element to these things they don't actually think there's a human element that's that's the problem problem. Uh, they think there's divine these are divine edicts written by the creator of the universe so if the creator of the universe does say do not sleep with another man it's unnatural uh you will be burnt for eternity i mean i can understand why people who believe that which is just a different topic in general. How the hell they get to that? It's indoctrination, etc. People who earnestly believe that, I can see that they think, and they are in their minds, helping people by saying, don't do that. We have to have laws against this because if this premise is true, if if this God exists, if, if this edict is accurate, then I'm saving you from just a, a punishment so much worse than you can even conceive. Like a lot of people don't really realize um infinity in hell like permanently in hell you can't conceive how bad that is it's the worst you think of the worst you can possibly think and then multiply it by a billion 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 and then you'd have to keep going like it's just it's nonsense it's absolute crap but people who believe this i feel bad for them you know it's a fundamental failure of our pattern seeking recognition you know abilities where um You'll you see this a lot in the South here in the U.S. where you'll have you know a particular um, incident that happens like or, or a weather pattern. You'll have like a hurricane that comes in, or you'll have a, a flood or an earthquake, and it's almost immediately afterwards that you have pastors coming out that say you know oh this happened because of the gays. It happened because yeah. they're you know engaging in these behaviors, and. It's it's it kind of goes back to, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah and people thinking like God is punishing you for, you know, these particular actions. And I think that that that's amazing, because if I could control the weather with my penis, I would turn gay so fast. I'm like, oh, man, like I I went on on vacation to, you know, 
uh, I don't know, insert crappy town here. And it was just absolutely awful. And the customer service Mm -hmm. was abysmal. And like, you know what they need? They need a tornado or something. I'm just, I'm just going to go like have some wonderful gay sex and, um, you know, do it in their hotel and then, and then just watch the aftermath. <laughs> It'd be a new form of warfare. You know, it, like North Korea would be just having some serious anal sex in order to direct the weather towards the US. <laughs> just, I don't know. But, but they're, they're just, when, they're when you, all, when you, they're ca- all facing in the same direction to direct God's yeah, yeah. wrath and anger. <laughs> That's a different type of cannon. <laughs> it's like, I'm so fabulous, I just leveled up. <laughs> My mage I mean, powers are off the charts. <laughs> I mean, joke, jokes aside, I do, if you read, you can get a legitimate reading off or interpretation off the, off the book, off the uh, religious symbols in general, off saying those things. So when, although it is Bat shit crazy, like absolute nonsense and hurtful nonsense to a lot of people. Um, I don't question really often that people genuinely believe what they're saying. They do actually think they're helping. But just, to move the topic yeah. forward just before we jump back into that, because we can we can definitely go into that. I mean, all three of us have a channel which is, you know, fighting against such depravity. As as long but, as I can come back to the them thinking that they're helping. Yes, absolutely. We can come back to that for sure. So I wanted to touch on The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins, which is something you mentioned, uh, Thomas. So are you both aware of The Selfish Gene? Uh, I read it a few years ago, so I would need cool. to, a refresher. Uh-huh. Yeah. What about you, Rachel? I, I've you not the... read the book, but I kind of know mm-hmm. the general premise. Yeah, awesome. I mean, I, do, I don't actually read often. I'm dyslexic and it takes me such a long time that I tend to digest things through um, auditory. Um, audio, sorry, I sh- should say. Audio but, books. Um, yeah, I quite enjoy an audio book. Put it on double speed and go to the gym. That's a good way for yeah. me to digest information. You but and I was... are kindred spirits. <laughs> yes, we are. So, so that's really interesting because um, I can't take anything. But not in that any... way. <laughs> I can't take anything <laughs> in from listening to it. I've tried audio books and I just mm. like... I zone out. I can't do it. I have to read things there's physically. Some, there's some great tests yeah. that I, I was fortunate enough to get in university, but you can do mm-hmm. them online. And they basically will give you a, um, uh, a level of different learning techniques, mm-hmm. such as auditory and uh, repeating. And there's just there's many. Yeah. And they will rank you on which one you perform most mm-hmm. um sufficiently on and so you can get an idea of i respond very well to this Mm -hmm. so some people will respond very well to uh watching a video some people respond well to reading well you're you can figure it out through there and then you can like utilize which one works most intuitively with you mine is watching videos and listening to audio i can i can take that in very well but reading Mm -hmm. is very very bad Mm -hmm. so a lot of the books that i recommend to people actually i haven't read but i have (laughs) Listened. digested yeah. a lot of content yeah, yeah. it's the I, same thing it is it is yeah. i mean the point it's, is it's like you're, if you're, you're if receiving your parents, information if your parents read a book to you as a kid you don't say mm. like you know i, I don't listened to that, that book you say oh we read that together yeah. exactly yeah so exactly. i i've always been like a mm-hmm. reader and i have to take notes as i'm reading to take things in like even when mm. i was a kid i'd like read along with my parents as they were reading books to me which is i think how i ended up reading so early when i was a kid because like my parents would point along with the words, and I'd just end up reading them and picking them up. And sometimes I'd be like, "Okay, I'm done with this page. We can turn over to the next one." And my mum would be like, "But I've not finished it yet." I was like, "Yeah, I know. I read ahead." <laughs> <laughs> I'm a slow reader because my brain daydreams, and I, I need to force myself. I need to go through some speed yeah. reading stuff and like force mm-hmm. myself to like just read faster. But if I like, if I start thinking about something, like my mind starts going in all kinds of different directions. I'm like, oh, that means this and that. And but if if I'm listening to an audio book on double speed, it doesn't allow me to do that because it just keeps plowing forward. See, yeah. I, I the, end up speaking of speaking of plowing forward, I, we should get back to gay sex. <laughs> exactly. Well, so when it comes to how can we actually show that uh, homosexuality is natural, that it's, it's selected for by by natural selection. Uh, one of the most important tools and most important discoveries is really the selfish gene by Richard Dawkins. So for anyone who's unaware, um, Dawkins proposed a gene-centered view of evolution as opposed to the then accepted individual-centered view. So questions such as, um, 
why when you decide to help a child a uh, child's in the road and you run across and you grab the child and you stop the child from being ran over you just put your own life at risk to save a stranger he's not your child you don't share like genetic you're not closely related in that sense that was proposed and said that kind of goes in the face of the idea that we've evolved to you know successfully reproduce ourselves and for a long time people weren't really figuring out how you square that circle well as Dawkins showed you don't actually square that circle at all what actually matters is the gene-centered view rather than the individual centered so that person going across the road and saving that child is helping himself um reproduce successfully because they're so closely genetically related those genes which happen to embody that one individual saves the genes of um, which are very much the same that embody someone else it doesn't have to be exactly the case and then when you have this view of evolution all of a sudden lots of stuff in nature makes sense a bee when a bee stings you she dies um in well, most cases Part, part of it, too, is like he, he talks about how, you know, you're much more likely to save your own children because you, are, you know, yeah. they, they, mm -hmm. they carry you share genes. genes with them. They carry your genes. Um, if let's say that, that my sister has several children, my nephews and nieces, I still share a lot of genes with them, you know, because I, I share a ton of genes yep. with my sister. And then I share, you know, half the, the amount of those with uh, with my nephews and nieces. And so, like, if you share, there's kind of like a cost-benefit analysis, like saving four of your nephews and nieces is kind of like, you know, saving one of you or something. Like, it's, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, so, so you can kind of start doing the math of, like, what percentage of your genes do you share with them? And, like, yeah. you have incentive, like a genetic incentive to protect your offspring for these genes to to continue to, to perpetuate it's not a yeah. conscious thing but it's like at a population level if these genes are, are reproducing and they're, they're going throughout you know mutating and reproducing yeah. they're more likely to stay in the population mm -hmm. if you're protecting those that that share these genes with you yeah and that, it's, exactly with with humans we've reached a point where we've we can kind of overcome our genes where um, certain traits like we, we traditionally lived in super small tribes and so we had you know most of the people around us we were related to and so it kind of became this population <laughs> level thing where you want to help all of those around you and then it as as we um as our tribe expanded peter singer talks about like the expanding circle like altruistic circle as we you know those traits kind of stuck with us and we developed the ability to think rationally and think critically and, and actually um not just operate like uh mechanical you know gene factory yeah and i i would add on that that that's it the gene-centered view pretty much explains exactly why racism is ingrained in us etc um because people of the same color for example tend to have closer genes to you you just you've just evolved to naturally want to have out uh, altruism and be benevolent towards people who are close to you and when it becomes someone who's a different color it's a natural instinct to not be as generous in those cases now again we're not appealing to nature to say this is the natural this is how it's done in nature therefore this is how it should be it's not it's a bad thing but it explains why these why racism is intuitive why it just it happens in like every culture it doesn't go because this tribalism We've evolved for it. And it, and in my case, it explains even more why we don't really give a flying fuck about animals that are really close to us, such as pigs. People yeah. do not care, whereas it, it, it falls into the gene-centered view of evolution. Well, so at Richard the same Dawkins, time, though, it, it also explains why theft and why violence um, is is natural. But yeah. at the same time, we because we've developed, you know, a complex brain that's able to to kind of understand like what would make a better society we can form societies and and have ideas you know that this mimetic evolution this evolution of ideas to like what we don't want to live in a society where oh hey because i look different than you i'm going to be treated different than you like we can form societies that are much more yeah. uh, structurally cohesive yeah. that get rid of you know mm -hmm. theft and violence and racism and hatred and bigotry exactly and we're fighting against our nature essentially we're fighting against something that's allowed us to survive allowed us to succeed we're now in essence fighting against um because we realize that when certain um principles are taken to their conclusion 
the what feels natural isn't right and we have to apply that logically consistently across the board uh, you can't make arbitrary distinctions and luckily we've done that with race um it's, it's definitely in the west where it's like no race is not a thing you, you cannot even though it might be intuitive to you you cannot because there's no reason to do it other than the yeah. fact that you've just evolved to be a tribalistic person and that's not a fault of yours it, everyone has it and the people that say that they don't they do like almost well, it's, everybody it's has like, it to some extent if i were to steal something of yours i might be a little bit better off having you know yeah. had that new thing but at the same time you know we put so social stigma and consequences and you know criminal punishments and stuff on that to to dissuade people from doing it because society as a whole would completely break down and crumble if yes. every yeah. single yeah, yeah. person was stealing things and we didn't have property rights and we didn't yeah. have any kind of rule of law Exactly. And, and this falls into just like secular morality in general, which a lot, which we, we should absolutely do an episode on, I think, because you can provide these justifications from um, the state of nature and, and logic and consistency rather than what a lot of people think. And that is that it's cultural relativism. It's just made up. It's not. There is really good reasons for why certain things are the way they are. So that I, I actually do think that we should definitely hit an episode on that if you guys are up for that. Definitely, yeah. But I just want to um, say, I want to provide some hard evidence mm. for homosexuality, like some studies, etc. So are you guys aware of epigenetics? Not really. I don't think. Somewhat. Somewhat, cool. So epigenetics is the study of how external factors can alter the expression of an organism's genes. Oh, so, this. Okay, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I just didn't know the name. Yeah, no, fair I didn't know the name. I knew that it was a thing as well mm. um, a while back. So a good example is a queen ant. So for a combination of how much nutrition they've received and pheromones and temperature, etc. So it's all unconscious. Depending on factors like that, um, this will alter the embryo that, that she produces or some of the embryos that she produces. And the result will either be a worker ant or a soldier ant. So she doesn't know it. But when there's a situation where they're in dire straits, it might be that because of the particular combination of nutrition and pheromones, etc., she will produce more soldier ants. Now, that's an example of an environmental factor altering the the expression of genes and exactly what happens. So there's lots of examples of epigenetics like that. And it's a really interesting field that's it, it, it's developed, but it's it's also underdeveloped. It reminds me a little bit of abiogenesis in the sense that it is underdeveloped and most people think but most people think it's more underdeveloped than what it is if that makes sense like what 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 i did with abiogenesis when thomas was teaching us about that i s assumed that there was less than what actually we know there's a hell of a lot same well, is like true when, with when scientists say when scientists say we don't know how it happened mm. they're not saying we don't know anything about how it happened yeah. they're saying yeah. like we can't conclusively say 100% for sure yeah. that this is the only way that it did happen but we know that it can happen this way Exactly. And science is always in that form of humility because they're afraid of embarrassment, unlike yeah. other ideologies. Well, and, and we um, can know with, with you know, uh, yeah. a fair amount of certainty. So we, we can yeah. be like 99% sure and still not know conclusively. Yeah. And also on the topic of knowledge um, and epistemology in general, I, I maintain that there is actually only one thing you can possibly know with 100% certainty and everything else is a maximum of 99.9%. That's that's it. You can't get to a hundred. What cogito ergo sum? Yeah, cogito. You know that at least in fa some form you exist. That's all yeah. you know. I um, think therefore I am. Yeah, yeah. You just you, you know consciousness can't be an illusion. But everything else, everything you could be wrong about. Um, but that that's a topic for another time as well. Very interesting. It really throws in an interesting hammer into the works, as I'm sure you've both uh, thought about yourselves. But um, I want to give the human example of um, epi epigenetics. This this blew my mind when I learned this. Can I just um, ask, I'm, is this yeah. related to um, those like experiments they did where I think if you get kind of like stem cells and stuff and change the environment they're in, they become that kind of cell? So they did one where they got um, stem cells and exposed them to moving blood and they became kind of like arterial cells. Is this related to that kind of thing? No, that sounds fascinating. That, that's that's really that's really interesting. It reminds me actually. I, I remember hearing. I haven't seen studies where people have said, um, although this is probably nonsense because I just haven't checked this up. But people go, if 
you eat a lot while pregnant mm. that that might change the expression um of the gender um b- before uh, before the three months etc i don't mm. know if that's true but i do know that there's certain factors that absolutely do contribute to the child mm. so people mm. that are grotesquely overweight they don't do their children a service in the mm. sense that the children actually are born with different fat cells um there's evidence mm. for stuff like that so that's an epigenetic uh, oh, okay. factor that's changing there's, things yeah. there's also a study of war zones where um in times of famine the children that were born afterwards were more likely to be obese after the famine was over because their bodies like while they were in the womb there were certain um chemicals that they were exposed to um from like natural chemicals from the mother that like basically were like this world is going to be tough you better store yeah. up all your fat and eat as much as you can that's fascinating and... i didn't i didn't know that that's but it makes sense it absolutely makes sense that you can have fine tuning yeah. to use i mean that's a, that's a, a gross a oversimplification but, yeah. but you know you, you are affected yeah. by you know yeah, but we've all we've all always known that. Um, well, we haven't always known, but we do know very certainly that um, that factors such as that contribute and change the way in which someone is born and consequently how they live their lives. But studies have found it's been repeated so many times that it's now known as the fraternal birth order effect. Um, if you don't know this, you'll find this interesting, uh, very interesting. If if you do, then pretend you do anyway. <laughs> but studies have found that once a woman has given birth to a male the chances of her next male being homosexual are increased uh, relative to the baseline population by 33%. That's insane. Like That blew my mind when I learned it because that's hard evidence. For as soon as a woman has produced a male, a male um, son, um, the next one stands a higher chance of being homosexual. That's telling you that there's that's something going on there. And, and, and it does. Essentially, Don't when tell you, my... Don't tell my older brother that, or else he's gonna, like, <laughs> he's, he's gonna tell me that I'm 33% gayer than him. Yeah, well, te- yeah, exactly. I mean, that's possible. So if like the baseline's 10%, well, the next one stands a 13% chance. Say, um, can I, can I just point out though that it's it's not it's not an either or. It's not just no. like you know, oh, you're gay or you're not. Like yeah. there's there's people who and and Kinsey did a bunch of studies on this. I think it was in the early yeah. 90s or the 80s where he looked at maybe it was earlier than that, but uh, he he brought in a bunch of of people and he showed them different images some of them uh homosexual and some of them heterosexual and he measured kind of the the um arousal levels among people even who claimed to be heterosexual and found that there was kind of a spectrum that people um there it was almost extremely rare that someone was a hundred percent heterosexual or a hundred percent homosexual you know you're normally somewhere kind of in the middle so like some people will say that they're bi and they're attracted to both. Well, chances are, like, even if you aren't actively attracted to the opposite sex, there's mm-hmm. probably still a little bit of, like, you see some nudity and it's kind of like, oh, whoa, like, that was interesting. Like, you <laughs> kind of, you know, but there's different there's different levels of that. So there might be kind of, like, a 5%, you know, interest. And you're like, uh, eh, not really my thing. Whatever. You do you. Or there might yeah. be, like, oh, my God, I just need to, like, swallow all the cocks now. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah they, so it's, I mean, it's, it's a very very much a gradient it's not it's yeah there not is, binary. They, they, it is it's very very much it's a, it's a good point to make um I... most of the studies that are done are strictly on male homosexuality and there's just not enough studies that are done I, um and I that's kind of the ask, message there. like the the stat you gave about like the second son and having yeah. like a 33 percent chance is there any mm. similar study done on daughters from, from what i could find there isn't actually that's but i it is, but female. Um, I did read somewhere else, but I actually can't remember the source, so I can't guarantee that this is ironclad. Mm. Uh, there tends to be far more bi curious females than there are males. But is that an expression of culture? It's hard to tell. There's too, there's many factors, yeah. etc. I do. Feel um, I've, that I've certainly it's a met lot more, more accepted for women it, than men. It is, yeah, it is. I've 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 personally met a lot more bisexual women mm. than I have men. Um, how much of that goes to the Abrahamic condemnation? Of- exactly. So how because, much of it is culture? Because a because lot of people the, that are like wording, fervently against it, they're gay. You know, they turn out to be gay. <laughs> you have the wording, if a man lies with another man, it's an abomination. Like, mm. there's nothing There's nothing really inherently about uh, women. I mean, it does say homosexuality, like multiple places. It just talks mm. about homosexuality. But then you have pastors who will kind of like, they have to bend over backwards and go through loopholes to mm-hmm. not be 
homophobic and they'll say things like, oh, it was referring to sex slavery and it was referring to pedophilia and these boys in the temple. And like, there's not really any indication that that's the case, but if, if they're able to, to use that to justify being decent, loving human beings and not be homophobes, then like go for it, I guess. I'll be honest, that type of Christian, that type of person really fucks me off. I have more respect for the people which actually read it for what it is rather than somehow manage to do a backflip. I mean, it's more convenient for me. It's more convenient for society. They seem like a more decent person by doing that. But just drop drop the bullshit book. I just I can't help but, but isn't feel that, that isn't way. that every every single Christian though cherry picks to one extent or another? Like they they'll go through I, and I, they'll, they'll say, oh, I agree with this verse, but not that verse. And okay, so, some of them do it by going through the verses and saying. I realize deep down that that is wrong. I'm going to somehow have to square this circle. And you know it's intentional. There's only one way you can read it that way, and that is by being dishonest whereas, or just being ignorant. Whereas if you look at others, such as, you know, the um, is it the Westboro Baptist Church? That, that's a solid reading. So a lot of people go, they're very hateful. And I just want to like say to them, they're actually reading what the book fucking says. Like it isn't a nice book. It's a harsh, barbaric, disgusting, outdated book. Um, nothing to base morality on. It's a nasty thing. But aren't, aren't when we all people... grateful? Aren't we all grateful that two billion Christians and over a billion Muslims aren't reading their book literally? Like some of them are, and those are the well, crazy radicals. Like the problems with the fundamentals of the teaching I, itself. You see, I have a but, I have a problem with this. They say they are fundamentalists or radicalists. What they're really saying is they take it seriously. They actually read it. They it's, actually it's true. read what it's it says. True, but and, I would rather have several billion moderates who aren't, you know, going out and like stoning people to death and th yeah. throwing gays off of roof rooftops yeah yeah you know ideally i would get rid of the religion altogether but i would much rather have mm. you know uh, okay so uh, let, fundamentalists let me put it in other words then i i very much appreciate that basically they don't read the book and they don't actually take it literally and somehow they do some cognitive bias and backflips mental backflips in order to read it another way it's very convenient it's very good but i would be lying if i said that i have more respect for those people i don't I just mm. don't. I respect people that actually take it seriously, that actually read it. If that God exists, if it did write re, um, uh, write the Bible, for example, when we're talking about Christianity, or Allah when it comes to uh, the Quran, you've got to take that seriously, and the edicts in it need to be taken seriously. And it's just, I, I it's, 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 it's hard for me. It's, it's two mm. things. I definitely respect people that take it more, more literally because even though they get. Uh, labeled fundamental they're just people that actually read the damn book whereas yeah. i do prefer people that don't take it seriously you know like there's a lot of christians in england they don't really take it seriously um but who am i to say that they're not a christian some of them don't even they're not even sure if jesus resurrected i think that's pretty critical to be a christian but you know who am i to say this so yeah i do agree with you that it's easier but i I, i'd just be lying if i said that i don't have more respect for the people that take it seriously one thing i will say to kind of be devil's advocate a bit is that the, while there are passages like the you know no man should lie with a man thing there are a couple of cases where the words it's like a little bit ambiguous what the translation yeah. is so there is a specific word that a lot of people say this definitely means homosexuality but because this word in like it's like some kind of Greek or Arabic or something, I don't know what it is exactly, but we don't really have any other instances of that word being used, we have nothing to compare it to, so yeah. there's a lot of debate about what it actually means. Some people think it means male rape, some people think it means um, a man having sex with a younger boy, and other people just think it means just homosexuality. Um, so in a lot of instances I kind of do understand why some people are a little bit iffy about it, because we yeah. don't fully know what it was meant to originally mean. But yeah, no, I, I see both your points. <laughs> and that's, at the same time, you have, you have like the story of Sodom and Gomorrah where like, mm. you know, it's like, oh no, don't rape my male guests. Instead, here, have my daughters and rape them. <laughs> yeah, Instead, yeah, yeah. they're still virgins that are pledged when, when, to be when, married. Yeah. Yeah, when I watch decent, he's a otherwise decent, uh, yeah, I mean, watching otherwise decent people read that kind of stuff, you know, like uh, the story of Lot, where people get turned to salt, etc., or even like the sto story of King David, you know, he has a child, and and God punishes David by killing the child. 
this is not morality, people. Sure. Like, have you lost your fucking mind? Like, why would you even worship that? That's horrible. It's just, it's just scapegoating. It's just not how it works. But um, yeah, I evidently need to create a new video where I bash religion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. So, with with the fraternal birth order effect being in place. I think it's fair. It's more than fair to say that that's the answer. Homosexuality is natural, and we can scientifically prove it. It seems that while homosexuals can't procreate themselves, within nature they facilitate and provide for heterosexuals that can, and in doing this they increase the survivability of heterosexuals who have a chance of producing homosexual children. So they succeed evolutionary obliquely rather than directly. Yeah. It's a bit like how when people say you have to spend money to make money. Mm -hmm. That doesn't seem right, but it is right considering the context and the circumstances that's the same of homosexuality well that's so, like if, if you have if just to, just to kind of hammer this point home as far as you know what, what what does that mean what are the ramifications of each successive male being more likely to be homosexual uh, homosexual if, if you think of it in terms of you're in a tribe and there's a limited number of females and there's you know a certain number of males and if let's say that that you have one son and he's you know he's straight and he's able to go and and you know have his choice of the the female to reproduce with and then you have another son and then another one and then another one and then all of a sudden you have like 10 sons that are all vying for the same few females if if some of them were gay they would be more likely to it's like oh hey like let me take out take care of my nephews and nieces and let me help yeah. take care of and it's like they're there's less competition. They're less likely to fight over the females. They're less likely to kill each other over the females and more likely to help with uh, raising their nephews and nieces. And so they're more likely to then pass down uh, their genes, even though it's not through reproduction, it's through their siblings, the genes that they share with their siblings being passed down through their nephews and nieces. Yeah, that's a great great point to hammer on you know just as just as a bee might sacrifice its life by stinging someone to stop them going near the nest mm -hmm. um but in doing that they actually preserve their genes because it's shared among yeah. the other bees and they're going to be able to successfully reproduce the same and is true as, of, yeah. as a result it's like if if there's a tendency like to for 10 percent of the population to or there, for there to be a 10 percent chance of you being gay or whatever the percent chance of of being gay and if you know, you're more likely to be gay, like the depending on birth order. If this is being passed down, like because this is in your genes, and so you become gay, it's not going directly through your lineage, but you share those same genes, and so like still that that likelihood of here's the percent chance of being gay or whatever, like that's still being passed down through the population. Yep, exactly. So with that settled, um, I've got one last bonus question for you both. It actually goes back to something you were saying earlier, Thomas, uh, as, as a joke. But here it is for you. Can you choose your sexual orientation? Mm. I don't think so. I think you can choose your sexual behavior. Yeah, but that's yeah. not your sexual orientation. Yeah. You can't choose what you find attractive. Like, you can choose to act on it or not, but you can't, mm -hmm. you know, choose what yeah, you so like. Ch it's controlled so by ch your ego rather than your... Sorry, it's controlled by your id rather than your super ego. Kim, I, I'm, yeah. I'm curious, though, how much you can force yourself to think a particular way. Because you can't... There is so much that you can do with brainwashing and, and you know, propaganda and stuff like that to the point where... Mm -hmm. It's like in the, the last episode, we talked about how culture can influence what you think is attractive. Like, yep. you know, as, as a kid, I, I mentioned that, you know, when I was younger, I liked girls the same age as me. And I wasn't really attracted to older women that had massive breasts. But as I got older and people pointed out those traits and stuff, I started to notice them more. I started to see them more. Like there was some level of cultural um, influence on it. You know, some people find... Uh, in some cultures bound feet that are in tiny shoes like attractive and so they'll crush their feet into these small shoes or they'll put giant rings around their necks the necks of women and elongate them so like certain traits are seen as attractive and not and so i, I think some of it can be influenced but like if you're if you're just born and you're living your life and stuff like there there is that genetic aspect that you have no control over if mm. you're if you're a, a flaming homosexual and you you love people of the same sex like you know, good luck changing it. Um, but 
just just to go back to what you said about like the age and stuff for a minute though i'm not sure how much of that is cultural and how much of that was to do with like your age because yeah, I, I that. yeah so i don't judge me on this i watched a documentary about non-offending pedophiles and they tried to explain hmm. it as though and they had like an expert on there who was like you know she'd like studied people and and things like that and she said that in a lot of cases people start being attracted to people at say like 12 years old and they're attracted to people their age and then as they get older it's kind of like their um what they're attracted to kind of changes with them as they age so then at 20 mm. you're attracted to people who are 20 at 30 you're attracted to people who are 30 and so on but she said with pedophiles they get kind of stuck in that place so they yeah. might be like you know still 30 and attracted to like 12 year olds and i mean mm. it, it's a problem but it's not really something they have control over so i'm wondering if like yeah. that was kind of just what you experienced thomas like at 12 you're attracted to 12 year olds at 20 you're attracted yeah. to 20 year olds you know okay but but what about people in different races who like um and and, and here's where, where i i would say that you know you you may be right on that mm -hmm. but uh, also like growing up overseas i didn't really have a lot of black friends mm. And I wasn't really attracted to black girls. And then I came back to the States and I met some who were, you know, very attractive and I started to notice them more. And so like what, you know, I, I found that. It, see, it seems that there's too many variables, mm -hmm. you know, because it, it's just, you can't really pinpoint it. So for example, when I was young, I used to like the typical girl, you know, big breasts, etc. Whereas as I got older, I just, I didn't really give a crap about those traits. What I cared about is if they looked after themselves, if they ate healthy, if they went to the gym, for some reason, those traits were just really attractive to me. Now, I can't pinpoint what that is. I can't say it's because um, because I started reading certain magazines or something. I know it isn't because I didn't read any magazines, but you know what I'm saying. It wasn't because I was exposed to certain things. Is it because I just aged and that was just the natural pattern of where my mind was going to go as I got older? Or was it because I started valuing... Um, people who look after themselves and and because of that that came there's so many variables and so many factors it's too hard to really pinpoint it but i think you're definitely right because you on on the fact that you said if culture can and it does we know this for a fact can change what we find of tr attractive you know such as victorians liking um overweight people what what's to say that it can't change your sexual orientation now i i personally think that some people who are born in a certain way, I don't think they've got a choice. I, I think they can hide it, they can choose their behavior, but they are just, they just like the opposite sex. It's, there's nothing they're going to be able to do outside of neuroscience. doesn't that depend on how far, how far to one end of the spectrum you fall? Exactly. So I think you might be right. When most Everyone could be molded, but some people were just fighting a real uphill battle. Like if you're born and you're, for example, I consider myself to be very straight. I'm really not interested in the other sex. Um, sorry, in my same sex, but, but I asked myself, could I choose to like men? Well, like you were saying, I could choose to behave as such, but I don't think I can. I really don't think I could. I'm not attracted but to if, it. But I mean, if the taboo and the stigma was removed and you were born in yeah. Sparta but, and yeah, it was like yeah, a, a yeah. bonding activity in like the yeah, military yeah. or something like. I, I would think because of the conditions and the way that I know my myself and the fact that I am actually not really affected. I'm, I'm obviously affected by culture, but not greatly. I really don't give a crap um, about any of those stigmas. Um, I think that if I was under such situations, I might be forced to create a bond with someone else because it it's just that's the practice. But I know I don't know, but I suspect strongly that I wouldn't like it as much as the next person um the problem is, is that there's so many variables that we don't know where that line is i do think that there's a gradient but i don't think it is all n nurture i think nature plays a massive role in the most vital thing that nature does and that is reproduction so i think mm -hmm. i think yeah i think well and, and even even if it was like i i do think that nature plays a massive role but even if if culture does affect what we find attractive to, to say that you have a choice in that is absolutely absurd because mm. we're, we're exposed to so many different things all throughout the day. Like we yeah. talked about um, in our last episode, how marketing plays on the fact that we don't really have a choice and we're so vulnerable to messages. Yeah. And if, if there's cultural influences all around us that are pushing us in one direction or, or, or another, you don't really have a choice. You don't really have 
you know, you can't be like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to suddenly think that I prefer V-necks to, you know, regular t-shirts or whatever. Yeah. Okay. And it, it's it, like this... you, you have preferences that are, are kind of your preferences. Now, I think that there is a I, massive, I, I, you know, that's a, I just wanted to add, can you choose your preferences? Yeah, well, and, and I think that comes down to like, where do you fall on the spectrum? If if let's say that you're you're fifty five percent gay and you you mm-hmm. you know, but and you're maybe forty five percent attracted to to someone of the, the of the opposite sex as you, then someone like that they may be the ones who are like they're so close that they're they're more bisexual, but they lean a little bit more homosexual, yep. and so then but then for them it's like it's it's not as big of a deal to be like yeah well i'm yeah. just going to have a heterosexual relationship so mm-hmm. they may be seen as you know these religious gay conversion therapies success stories of this person they used to be attracted to the opposite sex and now we've saved them and it's like no they still have that same amount of attraction you've just repressed it you've, and made you've them just, depressed well done well, so, well you've you've suppressed it but then you have other people who go through those same you know conversion uh, experiences the gay conversion therapy or electroshock therapy, which is fucking horrific. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. you you have them go through something like that, and maybe they're ninety five percent gay, and they come out of it and they're like, "I'm not any different than I was before. I just yep. feel like a piece of shit, and I feel you know judged and awful, and like I'm God's failure, and so I'm gonna go kill myself, well, and because you know of- I don't want to." go to hell or, or something for, for kind of, accidentally sinning. Th- this good, like this makes me want to ask a question because I saw an advert for a documentary the other day um, called something really trashy like My Husband's Gay and it's about like really fundamentalist Christian men who say, yeah, I'm gay, I'm attracted to men, but I choose to live my life married to this woman and we have like three mm-hmm. kids together. And I kind of yeah. like, you know, you th- they talk in this, like, I, like I say, I only saw, like, a five-minute kind of teaser clip for it. But they talk about how, yeah, I'm attracted to men, but I know it's an abomination, so I choose not to do it. And then the woman's like, oh, yeah, our, our sex life is fine. We have sex and this. And I'm like, I kind of wonder. They, like, these men say they're happy, but if they're spending so much of their life suppressing a part of, of themselves that they, they know is there, how happy can they really be? You know, mm-hmm. and I just kind I mean, of like want to see what you guys thought of that. Think of it this way: if Steve, you're not attracted to guys at all, no, and and all. I would take it that, that the thought of gay sex probably kind of grosses you out a little bit. It you know, it's it's, <laughs> it's it's not something that you're into, and nope. that's fine. That's that's like, but imagine it this way: to someone who's gay, the thought of straight sex may feel exactly the same way. It does, as, yeah. And so, so if you know, again, depending on where they fall on that spectrum. But if if you lived in a society where everything was suddenly reversed and all of a sudden it's stigmatized to have straight sex and you're, you know, you don't want to have, you know, everyone in, in around you saying, you know, you're an abomination and you're evil and you're spawn of the devil and stuff just because you feel that attraction to women and you're kind of repulsed by gay sex, but you force yourself to be in this this relationship with someone having this sex that kind of grosses you out and turns you off and is not your thing. And, you know, you're in this uncomfortable situation that society has placed on you because you can't just be yourself. You can't just love who you want to love. It doesn't affect anyone else. It doesn't influence anyone else. You're just two people having a consensual relationship where they love each other. That's yeah. amazing. Like, why can't we have more of that? Yeah. I, you I know, actually because, that exact... because, it's a... because if the books are true, <laughs> then then there's real consequences. That's the problem. This is again where religion fucks things up. Um, it just it like you said, there's no problems with it. You know, there's just there's it's just what someone wants to do um, consensually with someone else. But the only way you can jump in and somehow make this a problem and claim jurisdiction over their experience, literally on who they can sleep with and what and in what position, is through religious ideology because it's faith driven rather than evidence driven. Yeah, and they, um, they say, oh, we're doing we're doing good for society because yeah. otherwise God would punish and judge our whole cities, so we have to kill the gays. Yeah, it's and like burning I can witches. It is. Yeah, it's, it's exactly burning witches. You know. 
The problem is just that people believe the stuff and there's good reasons. Well, there's not good reasons for the beliefs, but there's good reasons for them believing it. And that's that they just take these books seriously and they actually read them rather than come up with cafeteria Christianity. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, it does fall into that. Yeah. I do so, think it's very, very bad. Yeah, yeah go, on, um, go on, Rachel. Yes, I was going to say, so I actually made a video on this like last week because, you know, uh, Kristen from Girl Defined she is extremely homophobic on her blog and she goes on about like the sneaky homosexual agenda and all this stuff and like i i made that exact point that you did thomas about how what if she was placed in a society where yeah. she had to not to be crude but she had to lick vaginas every day to be accepted into heaven how would she feel about yeah. that and and i made all these points and like I said to her, I was like, I can see why she wants to use the Bible to back up her point to. Because if you take the Bible out of this, there is no reason to be against homosexuality. You look at this from like an emotional, you know, loving other people perspective, not wanting to do harm, there's no reason to be against it. If you look at it from a logical or rational perspective, no reason to be against it. The only real reason mm. you can have to not want anyone to do it is to say that God wouldn't like it. But then I have to say, if a god was real, and he was this big supernatural being who created an entire universe and everything in it, do you think he'd really care where one person put their penis? <laughs> do you know what well, I mean? Uh, and and yeah, the, the, I mean... the word gay agenda, too. It's like, <sighs> gay agenda? Yeah. Like, like what, what do they think that <laughs> this gay agenda encompasses? It's like... Gay people want equal rights. Yeah. They're not yeah. trying to get some type of superior status where, like, no. we want to have, you know, you have marriage. We want to have super marriage. Like, we want to <laughs> yeah, force yeah, yeah, you yeah. to have gay sex, too. It's like, no, if you think that gay sex is gross, yeah. here's don't a solution for you. Don't do it. Yeah. Like, that's yeah. that's it. Like, it's well, not well, that they, hard. It's even worse. They say you're stepping on our right to claim jurisdiction over your rights. That's actually what's said. It's like you're t stopping us from practicing Christianity in some extent. And it's like, no, I'm stopping you from making them practice Christianity because they don't buy into that horse shit. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, and there, there was, I was watching this, this, um, what's his name? Steven Crowder. He's like this right wing, yeah, um, yeah. guy. And he, he does this, this thing. He goes to college campuses and, you know, changed my mind. And he talks about it. And like, he was talking about, um, trans rights and stuff. And he's like, well, you know, we don't determine laws. We don't base laws over like some, you know, off case, some like, you know, non, almost non-existent case, some small, tiny little fraction of society. And I'm like, actually, the measure of a society's morality is how do they treat their minorities? How do they treat the weakest yeah. individuals? Yeah. It's not just, hey, I'm bigger than you. I'm stronger than you. Like I'm some authoritarian rule. I'm going to get my way. No, you can tell which societies are decent places to live in based off of if you're the least uh, privileged, if you're the, you know, you have the least rights and the least power and everything, or not the least rights, but if you have like, you're in some, you know, off case, are you treated like a decent human being? If, if you're born with some type of defect, are you taken to the edge of a cliff and thrown off of it? Or do people have compassion and treat you like a decent human being? And yeah. that that's where like, it frustrates me. It's like, no. Gay people, they're not asking for special rights or special privileges or something. They're just saying, like, we want to be treated well, too. Like, we want to be loved, too. We don't want to be stigmatized and hated on. Just treat us like humans. I tell, I tell you what, I, I, I shall conclude this with the best argument I've actually heard against um, same-sex marriage. And that is <laughs> that um, same-sex divorce will be really fucking eventful. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine that gets bitchy quickly. <laughs> I don't know, like, that's that's kind of, like, an interesting thing, though. Like, a lot of people assume that, like, gay marriage is going to be between, like, two proper sassy, like, overly feminine men. What about just two normal women? That probably wouldn't get bitchy. Well, I don't know. Well, women can be, it's, two, but... it's two women, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, I but no, that's uh, a good honestly, point. Honestly, like... as, as as someone who's been through a, di a regular divorce, there's no such thing as a pretty divorce. I mean, like, nah, nah. yeah, th there's cordial breakups and stuff, but it's still like, hey, yeah. like, we committed to each other, f you know, yeah. allegedly for life and mm -hmm. loved each other, and all of a sudden you're splitting up and there's lawyers involved and stuff, yeah. and it it's yeah. not nice. Well, what was his <laughs> name? No, <I'm> just joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're you're absolutely right. It's not it's not a great affair. Um, to go through I, I imagine anyway I fortunately not had to go through it 
So on, on that note, I'm going to conclude by just repeating that homosexuality is natural and there's there's scientific evidence for it. There isn't proof in the sense of like absolute knowledge, but we've been through this before. That's not how science works. It works under a humility of saying there is a lot of evidence in favor for it. And the assertion that it's not natural comes from basically Abrahamic religion, some sects of Hinduism, etc. There is there is religion. It's basically a religion-based argument and religion just doesn't hold any sway because it doesn't have at least in the realm of logic and reason and rationality because it doesn't participate in those things it's it's faith-based so so with that i shall say thank you everyone for listening to us um take care uh, rate us on itunes if you'd be so kind we'd really appreciate that and um join us next week for the rascal rachel oates um we haven't Mm. uh, have you decided yet on what you're going for Uh, yeah we're going to be talking about like antibiotic resistance and stuff like that and what it means for the future tune in for that (laughs) that's a bombshell that's going (laughs) to be amazing This has been an absolute blast. And now we want you to join in the conversation over on the Here and Now Facebook and Twitter pages. Or follow us on Pinterest and Instagram if you just want some of the dankest of sciencey memes. If you like one of our particular styles, check out each of our YouTube channels, Rachel Oates, Rationality Rules by Stephen Woodford, and Holy Kool-Aid by me, Thomas Westbrook. To find all of our episodes, show notes, contact information, and more, warp on over to our home base, theherenow.com. If you enjoyed this episode and want us to succeed in spreading the love of science, you can help us out by giving us a five-star review on iTunes or Stitcher. And to all our friends and family listening, thank you for spending this episode with us. We'll be back to explore another exciting big idea next week. Now go create something magnificent.